Hey folks, I'm Alex Dowd. And I'm Katie Reif. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about the summer blockbuster season, that time of year annually when Hollywood uh, traditionally releases its biggest popcorn entertainments. We'll get into the history of that trend, and each of us will decide the best single blockbuster season since the 1970s. Welcome to Film Club. Okay, so it's early May. As we're recording this. Is it? (laughs) Who knows these days, actually? Is it May? Is it February? Is it Tuesday? I don't know. (laughs) Um, (laughs) This is the time of year, annually, where Hollywood generally begins releasing its, its biggest titles, its big special effects movies. Uh, We are at the onset of what would normally be the summer movie season. Yeah, this time last year we were gearing up for uh, the Avengers, the latest Avengers film, as I recall. That's right. Actually, I think it was out at that point and uh, uh, at at this point last year and was abolishing, was just demolishing box office records at the time. Yes, yes, (laughs) yes. There is, uh, there's no Marvel movie this year. Uh, Black Widow was supposed to open uh, the first weekend of May, and that has not happened for obvious reasons. And if you look at the uh, release calendar, there's not a whole lot opening for a while. Yeah. There are still a few things randomly here and there that are on the calendar, but I think the next big movie that's officially scheduled to open at this point is Tenet, the new Christopher Nolan film, and that's in July. Whether that happens or not remains, I would say, up in the air. It sort of depends on where things go. Yeah, the studio seems to be kind of clinging to it as a sort of a, the point of like, we'll see what happens. This is this is the point where we will see what happens. Exactly. And uh, I honestly would not be shocked if we pass this entire summer without a movie opening in the theaters. Again, that remains to be seen. Well, what do you mean, Alex? They're, they're only doing temperature checks and, and, you know, you only have to go behind a pane of plexiglass to see a movie and sit... <laughs> 13 feet away from everybody else. It's a perfectly normal experience that everyone wants to do. <laughs> That's true. They, yeah, they did announce this week that there are these new, uh, there's going to be these new restrictions on going to the movies. It's going to be a lot like going through TSA. Yeah. And I got to yeah. say, I, I, miss the, I miss the movie theater experience a lot. I am not going to replicate the experience of going to the airport in order to go see the Goonies on yeah. the big screen, you know? This was a Variety article about theaters reopening in Texas and the way they described the sort of the process that you'd have to go through to see a movie. I was sitting there going, yeah, I miss movies, but this doesn't seem worth it. (laughs) No kidding. So, yeah, uh, for the last, I would say, almost half a century, really, this is the time of year in which Hollywood has released a lot of its its biggest projects. Uh, It's sort of generally thought of as the summer blockbuster season. So that means big special effects movies. It means sequels. It means uh, sort of star-powered comedies, giant Disney animated films. Mm -hmm. It, 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 it's it's the time of year when when Hollywood mostly unleashes the films that it has the most faith in as box office performers. Yes, faith to make money, not necessarily faith in its quality. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, we both grew up in the 90s, so we remember mm-hmm. this trend well. I mean, it, it's something that's been going, we're going to get into where this started, but it was in full swing in the 1990s, a, a, a time when every summer brought bigger and bigger movies and I don't think that's changed necessarily in well it has changed in some ways and that's another thing we're going to get into but I think the summer remains a time in which you can count on seeing something that cost a shit ton of money (laughs) yeah the 90s when you and I were you know teenagers the age where you go see pretty much anything that comes out that was the heyday of the disaster film (laughs) yes yes absolutely so uh when we talk about blockbusters Mm -hmm. uh, what's the etymology of that expression oh well my favorite thing you're letting me do my favorite thing i love it (laughs) um so one might think that blockbusters comes from people lining up around the block to see a movie but this is actually incorrect the term is older than you would think the term actually predates the blockbuster as we know it. It was used to describe films that pulled in a lot of box office. The term was used actually before the invention of the blockbuster as we know it in terms of these big special effects extravaganzas. It, uh, the term actually comes from World War II and it is a reference to a type of bomb that was developed during the war that could destroy a whole city block and thus it was called a blockbuster. And around the same time, uh, trade publications started using the term blockbuster to refer to a movie that made huge box office. And the term kind of died out a little bit 
uh, a post-war, in the post-war era when the, I suppose the image was less fresh in people's minds, but it re-emerged in the late 70s with the phenomenon that we're talking about today. For sure. And I think that's an important distinction to make because, I mean, there Hollywood has always, I mean, since very early on in, in, in the early years of Hollywood, there have been big budget productions. I actually look at something like the true grandfather to me, as far as I'm concerned, of the modern special effects movie mm-hmm. is really King Kong. Yeah, uh, yeah. The early 30s. That sort of sets so many of the traditions and, and so many of the tropes that we're used to seeing in, in giant blockbusters cinema but the idea that a particular time of year uh, the, the, the idea of, of one time a year the warmer weeks of the year the time when Hollywood is going to release most of its big special effects movies mm-hmm. uh, that dates back to really the 1970s and uh, most people trace it back to a single movie and that would be Steven Spielberg's Jaws in 1975. Yeah, and I think something that uh, is important to kind of uh, reflect on with the blockbuster term, too, is when it was originally used, they were described, it was a reactive term, you know, after a film did well at the box office, they called Mm -hmm. it a blockbuster, but post-Jaws, studios started intentionally creating proactively blockbuster fare. Yeah, and the use of the term became different. I mean, we talk now about movies that simply have the aspirations of being box office hits. As blockbusters, I think it's also become a term to describe movies that are just big or star-powered yeah. or expensive or, you know, when the when the truth is that in its purest form, a blockbuster is a movie that makes a ton of money as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think that what Jaws changed for a lot of people, uh, for a lot of the studios, was that before Jaws, um, the summer was not always thought of as a time, as a time where you could you could have a, a big lucrative hit. It was thought of a, a, as a time where people didn't ne- didn't necessarily want to go to the movies. They wanted to be outside. They wanted to go to a real beach instead of seeing one on screen. <laughs> and also drive-ins were much more popular then. That's true. So you did have an option to go see a movie outside more often. That's true. So at the time, I mean, there, there, there were plenty of studios that, that thought of the summer as a time in, in, as sort of a write-off season, as a time when you did not release things you had a lot of faith in. You did not release things that you had invested a lot of money in because you might not see a return on that investment. Mm-hmm. I think Jaws shifted that paradigm in in, in, a, in a couple ways. Um, it was, uh, for one thing, it was heavily, heavily marketed and heavily marketed on television, Mm -hmm. Um, which was not something that was uh, always common in the 1970s. The other thing was that it was one of the first movies to be released by Hollywood on a nationwide scale all at once. Yeah. Um, Distribution models at the time, the way that that movies were released in the 70s and and before the 70s, up until Jaws, uh, was a lot like the way that indies are released today. I mean, movies would kind of play different markets and, and sort of roll out into different markets slowly. It wasn't all that common at the time to see a movie open everywhere at the same time. Especially um, not around the world, like you right. see now. Totally, yeah. I mean, yeah, now the, now the situation's completely different in the sense yeah. that they're now looking at global box office. But with Jaws, they were like, we're going to open this in, in every theater nationwide. And I, I think that was considered a gamble at the time, but it definitely paid off. Uh, mm-hmm. Jaws was a huge hit. It made something like uh, $7 million its opening weekend, which at the time was huge, just based on ticket prices. And people lined up around the block. I think it fed into this idea that this was this phenomenon that you sort of had to see. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, it was it was a movie that everybody was seeing, and you had to be part of that club, yeah, you know? You had to be there. And, you know, in a way, it builds on what we were talking about in our movie theater episode, where Psycho made film going more of an event. This was kind of building on that. For sure. And uh, it, you know, it pretty rapidly changed Hollywood, and it changed the kind of projects that Hollywood was investing in, and it turned summer into this destination time for these these big movies. And uh, Spielberg was a big part of that. Uh, he would continue to, I mean, he remains a, a sort of a summer movie maestro, but through the years that followed, he would continue making movies that were targeted for summer audiences, so to speak. Uh, his pal George Lucas uh, did that as well. I mean, Star Wars is 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 the next sort of giant world changing blockbuster that opened after after Jaws in 1977. It was also it was a May release, and uh, from there, I feel like Spielberg and Lucas sort of re- helped 
reshape the whole landscape um, of Hollywood movie making. Yeah, and uh, the thing to note here is Spielberg and Lucas were both of what was, you know, referred to as the film school generation coming up in the early 70s. And those two share a important sort of common denominator in terms of content. We talk about elevated genre now, but when you look at a film like Star Wars or Jaws, it's not too different. Only the genres in question that they were dealing with were uh, AIP, Roger Corman, drive-in B movies. The Jaws and Star Wars use a lot of elements of those kinds of films, but with bigger budgets. And that it, uh, basically established the template for the modern blockbuster today. It's the kind of, I don't want to say cheap thrills, but more visceral thrills that previously you would get from B movies and drive ins, which were independent productions. And it was the studios taking them over and putting studio budgets behind that type of entertainment. Right. It's B movies with an A budget, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, like what yeah. Quentin Tarantino does today, or, you know, you could even say A24 does that on a smaller scale. Mm hmm. The two of them ended up sort of joining forces for Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I think is the perfect example of what you're talking about, which is a movie that is so steeped in in adventure serials of mm -hmm. both men's childhood. And to me, Raiders of the Lost Ark is really the film that announces, though, though both Jaws and Star Wars were obviously these kind of, were these enormous summer hits that I think helped uh, sort of usher in this new era. Raiders to me feels like still like maybe the quintessential summer movie in that what it does is it just kind of strings together one set piece after another yeah in the style of a serial so exactly yep, yep. Um, so from there, uh, I think I feel like summer movies largely became about these kind of there were these sensation delivery devices, you know. So what you were seeing for the first time really was maybe not for the first time, but but on a, on a large significant scale was a, movies that existed basically to just give you uh, one hit of 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 pleasure after another, mm -hmm. like Pop Raiders of the Lost Ark. Popcorn movies, exactly. And after Raiders, I mean, the, the last, you know, the last 40 years or so of of Hollywood entertainment has, I, I think, reflected that that strategy, mm -hmm. at least when it comes to at least when it comes to to the big summer movies. It is interesting that once Hollywood got a hold of this idea of doing B movies with A budgets, they've just continued to consolidate that idea further and further and further until now it's most of what the major studios do. Yeah, and I think we're going to get into more of that soon. Um, we're going to talk about the way that uh, that blockbusters have sort of taken over Hollywood in general and that uh, where once that was one part of a, one might say, a studio's portfolio, they're now that's now in, in many cases the only part of their portfolio. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, we talked a little bit about this uh, last week on our streaming episode about how Netflix has taken the place of the mid-budget studio. So if you want to hear more about that, we talked about that last week. So again, you and I grew up in this era. So uh, we basically, uh, these parameters, I feel, th these sort of release parameters are sort of ingrained in us. Um, <laughs> I, can, I can barely remember a time in which summer wasn't thought of as the time when all of the big, exciting movies for kids of all ages were opening. Yeah, that's um, the thing. That's the thing. It is a little bit, when you think of, when I think about my childhood experience, it's crazy to me that they didn't do this always simply because kids are off school in the summer. It's true. And we would go to the it's movies because we were off school. Yep. And uh, there has, I mean, I feel like there has been a little bit of an evolution over the years and that you can look at summer in terms of uh, the different months representing different things for, for, for what kind of, what, what exact kind of blockbuster you were going to get. I mean, uh, for a long time, I feel like Memorial Day was the unofficial kickoff of mm -hmm. summer, but that moved back to early May at a certain point. <laughs> yeah. I, the first time i remember a the first weekend of may being an event i feel like was uh when twister opened in 1996 ah yeah twister yeah and i won't say it's announced... a great movie but i remember it fondly <laughs> the, i will say the the effects in twister have not held up uh, <laughs> yeah I caught it on tv that's definitely a, a very that's a corny crowd pleaser of a movie i don't hate it either um, yeah but uh, the effects work, which was once considered state of the art, you know, the, the cow being whipped around mm -hmm. by, by the tornado now looks really bad. Yeah, um, early CG. <laughs> we could do a whole episode on the evolution of CG. And... <laughs> For sure. <laughs> May is sort of the start of it. And then by the time you get to August, it's like uh, all of the studios have acknowledged that everyone is kind of fatigued by these movies. So what you generally see in August is... 
It is more well, the dregs in August. Usually. For sure. And it's stuff that's like more disreputable, a little cheaper. Again, this is traditionally speaking. I do think mm-hmm. that these notions of how the calendar works, the release calendar works have changed. But um, August was always seen as like, okay, well, here's some crap. Enjoy. <laughs> Go back to school now. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Your parents um, are tired of you. <laughs> You're tired of the right. movies. <laughs> Go back to school. <laughs> and uh, then the fall, of course, became a, a time for for the serious adult fair for awards contenders. Mm-hmm. It was sort of seen as like, okay, well, if if August was the hangover, uh, Hollywood's hangover period, the fall is like that Monday morning when you're like, okay, well, I got to get serious now. All right. Yes. Uh, it's like the rest of the week. When it's the like A the students show up, right? Yeah, you know, the yeah, honor exactly. roll. We had our fun, but now it's serious time. <laughs> um, and that, that still I mean, holds somewhat true. I it think. does kind of. I, yeah. mean, I, I think that, that prestige projects still kind of have a stranglehold on the fall months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, this this is uh, the last. I looked into this in the thirty of the last forty five years, which is to say, in 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 all the time it's passed since Jaws came out, uh, thirty of the last forty five summers have produced the biggest hit of the year. Yeah, I believe that. And, you know, when we talk about breaking down the calendar, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, a few additional ones of those are movies that would be summer blockbusters, except now the calendar is expanding to include, for example, like uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas as blockbuster dates. Right. Totally. So what's the first time you remember being excited for a big summer temple? Well, for me, I, you know, when I was a kid, uh, the first non-kids movie that I remember being really excited about and really into was Jurassic Park. I read mm-hmm. the novel. <laughs> I read both the junior novelization and the Michael Crichton book. <laughs> <laughs> the junior novelization was very cute. Um, and it leaves out a lot of the gorier details. And I remember I used to play Jurassic Park in the backyard with my friend from down the street where basically you just get going on the swings as fast as you could and then you yell, the Velociraptors are coming! You take off across the backyard. So, Jurassic Park. <laughs> you know, that was a huge one for me too. Um, I was a dinosaur kid and... Me too! Think, oh my god. Yeah. Did you know all the names and stuff? Oh yeah, my mom still tells a story about how I corrected a museum tour guide once. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, my fate was sealed very early. <laughs> yeah, Jurassic Park was big for me, too. I remember I actually sort of tie it to, uh, I mean, I started reading Entertainment Weekly. Oh, uh, yeah. The year, it, the summer it came out because Jurassic Park was all over on the cover. And uh, it was just this, it's the first time I really remember thinking, this is all that people are talking about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was that much of an event. And, and at that point, I was um, I was probably nine. And, uh, like, I, I was becoming aware of uh, a culture around movies in general. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Jurassic Park was definitely, like, the first time I found myself obsessed with a movie before it came out. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Entertainment Weekly around this time was kind of the Bible for young budding film nerds yeah for sure and uh i mean i probably was aware of some things before that i think i i because i mean uh sort of infamously my 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 dad was very uh had a very laissez-faire attitude about what i was allowed to see (laughs) i love hearing about this because mine wouldn't (laughs) let me watch r-rated movies and i'm like you watched what (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean my my dad was like he he there was the the content restrictions barely existed in my household at least that wing of my household i love hearing about this this is so wild to me (laughs) so i was already at that point a big fan of the alien films so alien 3 was one that i was i remember being kind of excited for i don't think that the i don't think i actually ended up seeing it until it was on video Mm-hmm. Because this was also obviously the blockbuster era, the blockbuster video era. Yes, mind you. Yes, two, two <laughs> kinds of blockbusters happen simultaneously. For sure. <laughs> but I do remember that being on my radar and uh, wanting to see it in the theater. Would they take you to R-rated films and let you in, or um, do you know, like, were you, was it just on video that you watched whatever? Just on video. I didn't. Okay. I didn't. I didn't see my first R-rated movie until about a year later. I went with my stepmother to see The Crow. Mm-hmm. In theaters. So I would occasionally, when I was younger, get to go see an R-rated movie. But for the most part, I, I caught those on video. Okay, yeah. I think because my mom objected to me going to them, and it was okay. easier for my dad to allow me to watch them on VHS. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, uh, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Jurassic Park, I, I, I shared that. I remember that being... I mean, that's one of... We talked recently about, about our seminal movie theater experiences. Mm-hmm. And I remember feeling I was so excited watching that movie. 
Um, that that to me is not only the first blockbuster I can remember being cognizant of and super excited for before it was out. It was also the fir- first blockbuster that uh, I felt like it completely lived up to whatever expectations I had for it. Okay, so since you had seen, you know, more adult, not adult films, but more adult geared entertainment, R-rated movies and stuff, did Jurassic Park scare you? Um... Not in the way that I think it scared a lot of kids. Because it scared um, the crap out of me. <laughs> I bet. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a scary film. I think I found it more exciting than anything else. Okay, um, yeah. I mean, I think that there, there, you know, there are two sequences in that movie that I would count as two of the better sequences in the history of blockbusters. Well, let me see if I can guess. Do you want to guess? Yeah. Velociraptors in the kitchen. Of course. What's the other one? The other one, which I think is even better than Velociraptors in the Kitchen, which is the T-Rex's attack on that. Oh. I feel like we could do a whole episode on that sequence, which is just so masterfully directed. Yeah. And so, you know, the fact that there's no music, the fact that he's playing with perspective so that mm-hmm. we're sometimes seeing the events from the people in the car. We're sometimes seeing them voyeuristically from people in the other car. The way that he's mixing CGI and this very practical giant tyrannosaurus that they built it's and and i remember feeling in the in that just this electric this electricity in that theater as people were experiencing that and that is one of those indelible pop culture moments where all you have to do is have a glass of water shaking and everybody knows what that's a reference totally yep yep that's yep you're right so can you remember the first time that you we talk about jurassic park as Mm -hmm. a summer blockbuster that uh paid off one might say the excitement that we had for it. Yeah. Can can you remember the first time? Because a big here's the thing. A big part about the summer blockbuster season is that it's there's a lot of boom and bust. It's a lot about sure. these movies that Hollywood is hyping to to the ceiling. You know, over the years, I, I remember another sort of uh, formative moment of of blockbuster awareness for me was the ad for Independence Day that aired during <laughs> the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. That just that shot of the White House blowing up and how big that ad was. And I feel like over the years, the, the Super Super Bowl is often the place where we get our first real glimpses of these giant movies that are going to open the summer. Yeah. Another, yeah, a structure to the year that doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. I exactly. Did, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the time these movies don't actually, it's its all hype and they don't actually pay off because some of them are quite poorly written or <laughs> some of them are, a lot of money has been put into them, not a lot of thought necessarily. Uh, can you remember the first time that you saw a blockbuster and uh, it, it completely did not. It was a complete disappointment for you. It completely uh, it was a complete bust. Yes. It's a movie that some people do like. I remember seeing Armageddon and absolutely hating it. I hated <laughs> Armageddon. I thought it was so bad. I couldn't understand why everyone was so excited about this dumb, dumb movie. Like, yeah, I... I remember thinking that was just a really stupid movie. And in retrospect, it is one of the better Michael Bay films. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that Armageddon because I remember us talking about when we were going to do, we were going to, we were going to launch the premise dome a few mm-hmm. weeks ago. We were trying to figure out, okay, so what are two movies where we disagree <laughs> on them? And, you know, obviously that same summer deep impact came <laughs> right, out. Sure. And, and we I was had like, to... I'm not doing Armageddon, man. I hate that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I honestly prefer Deep Impact as well. Again. <laughs> and that came out the same summer, that 1998. And it, uh, I think that uh, I would have to agree about that particular year because there was a movie that came out that year that sort of represents for me that, oh, these giant things that I'm looking forward to, they're being hyped, could actually be really bad. And that was Roland Emmerich's Godzilla. Oh, man. And that and that movie, too, was merchandised and advertised within mm-hmm. an inch of its life. What was it? Taco Bell? Bell had a Godzilla tie-in with the Mountain Dew and everything. Yes. Oh my <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah. Well, that... and the ads were so, um, the ads sort of exemplify, I'd love to write about this sometime, honestly, but the ads so exemplified this idea that there's this giant thing coming mm-hmm. and we're only going to give you a little glimpse of it and then you'll get to see it eventually. And it's this huge thing. There was one ad where like Godzilla's foot comes down and crushes a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex a skeleton, which is mm-hmm. the movie sort of slyly being like bigger than Jurassic Park. Because <laughs> sure, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. the, the previous summer, The Lost World had come out and that mm-hmm. was, um, that was obviously the Jurassic Park sequel. And I think for a lot of people, the moment I, I would imagine that uh, if we had other people on this show, they might acknowledge the lost world as the moment where summer movies um, sort of uh, jump the shark and they realize yeah. that a summer movie could fail to pay off on, on what it's offering. Yeah. Um, I, 
I think Jurassic Park 3 is hilariously bad, but <laughs> otherwise there's a real that franchise is a great example of huge drop off. The first one is so good and the rest are just whew. Listen, I have to disagree with you. I actually what? quite like The Lost World. Uh, I think it has some of uh, it has some really remarkable filmmaking in it. Okay. I, I do think that uh, the the sort of common complaint that it loses the wonder of the first movie is pretty pretty accurate, and it's also incredibly dumb in some ways. <laughs> um, but if you kind of think of it as a really well made slasher movie. In a way, okay, if you look at it like a Friday the Thirteenth movie where Jason has been replaced with a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Oh, I love there's that. There's some really good sequences in it. Uh, I mean, okay. the, the, the the sort of trailer going over the side of the cliff, I think, is one of his better pieces of action filmmaking. All right, well, I'll I'll watch it again and think about Friday the Thirteenth when I watch it. And okay, let you know if that changes my mind. Cool. <laughs> but Godzilla for me, this was even a year later, and maybe my sensibilities were just changing and they were evolving a little bit, or maybe I can just recognize the difference between how Roland Emmerich stages this kind of stuff and the way that uh, Spielberg does. Mm -hmm. I mean, because his Godzilla is a blatant Spielberg bite yeah. in a lot of ways, down to a sequence with baby Godzillas that's basically just his version of the Raptors in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I just remember, even at the time, being fairly young, being like, this isn't very good, is it? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it is, a, it is a quintessential moment. Yeah. For me, Armageddon was more about feeling out of step with everyone around me, because everyone around me liked it. And I was like, really? That could be such an alienating experience yeah. when, you're, when you're seeing a movie with people who are loving something and you're just like, what are you cheering for? <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, um, that, uh, I, I do still occasionally think about that South Park episode uh, that's all about this where they play landslide at the end. Which episode is that? Uh, that's the episode where I think Stan, he basically has this experience and becomes cynical and him and his friends uh, go see a movie and all he hears is like fart sounds and poop sounds and they're all loving it and he's like, I, I don't get it. And it ends up being a really disillusioning experience for him existentially. I totally remember that episode and I, it, for the most part, I associate that episode with my kind of, it, it, the, the irony of it is that th that was actually the moment right after that episode where I started to kind of feel that way about South Park. Oh, the irony. Oh my God. Because they set up this whole idea that 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 stan and kyle are not going to be friends anymore and right. then they resolve it in the premiere so easily and they lampshade that even by being like you know we're we're basically we're old we're not going to change our ways going forward here mm -hmm. but i remember that being this is very much a tangent i guess but i remember that being <laughs> a, a moment where i was like south park kind of lost me from there <laughs> But. Yeah, you know, like, there are a lot of critiques you can make at South Park. Uh, they come up every once in a while. Uh, our ex-colleague Sean O'Neill wrote something for the site a few years ago that's all about the sort of positioning of South Park and how it tries to have it both ways. Totally. That is, however, a topic for, for another episode. Anyway, <laughs> this has been South Park Corner. <laughs> so I want to talk now about the fact that the, the traditional notion of the summer movie season has changed over the years. And it's not that studios don't release the kind of movies that they used to release during the summer. It's more that the type of movies that used to kind of exclusively open in the summer mm -hmm. now open year round. All year round, parts. every yeah. every month, about once a month. Maybe? Almost, anyway. Yeah, I'm yeah. very close to Every that. Every two um, months, for sure, you'll have a big, big event. And uh, I remember the first, the first, the moment that to me that really felt like the traditional notion of a segregated summer movie season, where where just these kind of the time of year where just these movies opened. The moment that I remember feeling like that that moment in our history is over was 2015 when The Force Awakens opened in December. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before it, every Star Wars movie had opened in the summer. And it was sort of, uh, they were they were almost synonymous in some ways, Star Wars and summer. And with The Force Awakens opening in December, it was almost like that, that was the official acknowledgement from Hollywood that those days were over. They were kind of creating a new event holiday, I, I, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, the past few years, they're trying artificially or maybe a little bit naturally. You know, like earlier I was talking about how summer is a natural time for movies that appeal to kids because uh, they're off school. The Christmas holiday is a time when a lot of people are off work and with their families and looking for something to do. So it kind of makes sense to me to put out a film like a Star Wars film around that time. Totally. And and it, it, it's not on. It wasn't unprecedented or anything. I right. Mean, I, even during our childhood, there were times when we talked earlier about Alien 
Alien 3, Alien Resurrection opened around Thanksgiving. Um, mm-hmm. However, famously, it did not do very well. <laughs> and I think I remember some chatter at the time that it was like, that was not the right time to open a movie. Like, like clearly, Alien Resurrection was a summer movie. What was it doing in th- around Thanksgiving? Yeah, you'll hear people blame uh, the, the, you know, maybe if a film doesn't fare so well, sometimes people will blame the release date. Like, for example, Bruce Campbell says that Army of Darkness would have done much better if it had come out in the summer. <laughs> that seems... A little presumptuous to me that, that it, America was going to flock in droves to Army of Darkness. He believes so. <laughs> sort of the definition of a cult film, but <laughs> all right, Bruce. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> Even before The Force Awakens, you were seeing studios play with this idea more and more. Mm-hmm. Marvel was playing with this a couple years earlier in 2013. I remember they released the second Thor film, The Dark World in November right around uh, like right before Thanksgiving and that was an enormous hit at that time and it sort of felt like a light bulb was going off Mm -hmm. uh, was turning on uh, above every studio exec's head like hey why do we have to we don't have to we don't have to compete for real estate in the summer we can potentially release these things in November and audiences will still go to them. Yeah, I think that is part of it. The the wanting each studio wanting their blockbuster to have its weekend where it doesn't have any serious competition. I do think that's part of it because studios will space stuff out. So it's oh, not yeah. all opening on the same weekend. Oh, and you'll see that too. And it was, it, it's one of the things where like sometimes there will be games of chicken that will happen. Yeah, the Studios yeah. will decide like who is going to take this date and who's going to blink first. You'll have studios moving a movie when uh, a blockbuster is announced for that time. Yeah, that happens pretty often. Yep, and you'll have certain movies that are just such guaranteed hits that nobody wants to open anything in their range, you know? Yeah, particularly some of the more recent MCUs with films which yeah. are just global events like we were saying right people are smart i mean there will be counter programming sometimes where people will be like let's Mm -hmm. open in a romantic comedy this weekend maybe that'll 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 get some bit some some side business and sometimes the romantic comedies aren't all that good (laughs) they don't (laughs) put out their best as counter programming always because they know that if somebody's going to go see this it's simply because they really don't want to go see the adventure yep yep in sort of deviating from that from that norm i think at least goes back a little bit to the early 2000s as well i remember um 2001 was the year that uh both the first harry potter film and Mm -hmm. the first lord of the rings film came out Mm -hmm. those i think those have a little bit more of an autumnal spirit you might say yeah they're a little more winter but at the same time they those are those are both giant effects franchises and uh in some respects they may have sort of tested tested and proved the waters for hollywood studios to say we can open these things in november and december and people will still go to them in droves yeah i actually would agree that the that um the tone of those films is less of a summer blockbuster tone particularly Mm -hmm. the lord of the rings films you know being high fantasy at all right well lord of the rings was like able to sort of toe that line between mm-hmm. being giant special effects movies but being prestige projects as well taken right seriously. exactly yeah i think it also has a lot to do with the way that hollywood and we we alluded to this earlier but the way that hollywood's own what their what their budget or uh, what they're funding and, and the projects that they're taking on and green lighting it has a lot to do with that in terms of why we're seeing summer movie supposed summer movies opening elsewhere mm-hmm. i think the truth is that hollywood more and more is kind of only investing yes, in exactly. summer movies. Exactly. <laughs> you know? If, if all they're making is summer movies, it makes no sense to save them for the summer, right? Exactly. Yep. And so it, it, we've seen over the years a the number of movies released by a studio going down with them putting more of their eggs in 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 smaller in <laughs> all, all, all their all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. Sure. Yeah. The idea is you spend an enormous amount of money and you hope the invest you you you, you like turn around a profit. They're not investing in the in the mid budget movies anymore, really. Mm-hmm. And well, it's interesting because of this because. Because that's the only kind of movies that big studios are putting out is it's created its own sort of nuances you know like mm-hmm. now you have the february superhero slot where they'll put out something a little bit quirkier like shazam or birds of prey mm-hmm. and then the late april early may slot is for the big 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 event movies and then like we were saying it's still sort of tradition the traditional august like you know, maybe their their A their A minus B plus material goes in August. 
Totally, totally. But I mean, even September now, which to mm-hmm. me, I, September feels like the month least likely to ever have a blockbuster, historically speaking. Even September quite recently had a Predator movie, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's... Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> so I think a lot about Titanic. You know, Titanic obviously was not a summer movie. Uh, it came out in December, uh, right before Christmas. Um, but it was supposed to be a summer movie. Uh, it ended up being delayed for several months because uh, they needed to do reshoots and it was grossly over budget. Mm-hmm. It was assumed that it was going to be this giant flop, actually. But the thing about Titanic is that Titanic has a record that I don't think any movie is ever going to beat, I'm convinced. Wow. And yeah, it's that Titanic was num- the number one movie in America for 15 weeks. Well, you know, if you do have a big blockbuster coming out once every two months, then yeah. And that's the thing about it. Like, there, there were movies before Titanic that, that got close to it. Titanic, I think, sort of uh, busted that record. And I think it had a lot to do not just with Titanic being... I mean, a lot of stars aligned with Titanic. And I think that it was going to be... I think that movie would be a sensation any time it was released, mm-hmm. probably. Mm-hmm. But I think the big deal with Titanic... One of the reasons Titanic has been able to hold on to this record, and no movie since has come even close to it. I think Avatar got six weeks, maybe. The Force Awakens got maybe four somewhere in that range. Yeah. The reason that no movie since I think has been able to do that is that the the whole idea of uh, of, of the calendar has changed over the years. And uh, Titanic was basically able to dominate that period because there were effectively no giant movies that opened between Titanic's release and the movie that eventually unseated it. I mean, it's very funny that the movie that actually unseated Titanic was Lost in Space. <laughs> 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 a notoriously bad movie but if you look at Lost but in like Space like a sci-fi movie with a known IP right yeah it's an effects movie I mean yeah. it, it basically is a summer movie released in April you know yeah and I think that if Titanic were released I thought about this on the like 20 years after Titanic 2017 that year in March we got Logan we got Beauty and the Beast. We, we got a King Kong movie. We got these big movies that honestly felt like summer movies. And that, at that point, had obviously become the new norm. Mm-hmm. If Titanic had been released in December of 2016, it would have lost it, its title as number one the minute it ran into one of those at the box office. Right, yeah. Um, this is also kind of tangential, but spring might actually be my favorite movie season now. Oh, interesting. Okay. I, I like spring for movies because it is when the studios pull out their stuff that's a little bit stranger and it's also a good time for like indie genre movies a lot of good indie genre movies released in like uh march i think it's a great period for art house cinema honestly. yeah a lot of good of art house movies come out in the spring for sure because the summer ends up being sort of the sundance it's- well, yeah, it, it, it's like it's like the indie version of the summer movie season. It's like <laughs> sure. all these breezy Sundance movies. Over yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the <laughs> Sundance Audience Award. <laughs> yeah, totally. Type titles come out in the summer, and then in the fall, it's the more studio kind of um, the studio equivalent of art house prestige pictures. But yeah, the 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 most interesting stuff comes out in like in your A twenty fours and neons of the world. A lot of really interesting stuff comes out of them in the springtime. Totally. So uh, I want to end by talking about sort of just looking back at various summer movie seasons. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the best summer movie season uh, since since Jaws came out? Since okay. 1975? So we should acknowledge up front that every once in a while someone writes an essay about this is the greatest summer movie season. And, you know, a few different years are thrown out. 82, 84, 88, 89. But they're always in the 80s. And so I think we, I think that most critics, uh, perhaps critics of a certain age, we have to acknowledge our age here. <laughs> and maybe <laughs> critics who are a little younger than us would say the 90s. But I think the 80s are the quintessential decade for blockbusters. I would agree with you on that, honestly. Even though the 90s have a lot of big, these big movies, I think that the 80s, this period when both Spielberg and Lucas were operating, you also had James Cameron before he before he went the Titanic route, you know. Mm-hmm. I would agree that the 80s are sort of the golden years. I mean, it's something, it's what Ready Player One is really about. You know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> the 80s as this, and we should also acknowledge that, well, we may have grown up in the 90s. There's a generational bias in the sense that we probably also saw a lot of these films in the 80s before the films that we saw in the 90s. Well, yeah. And that, and they were already sort of kind of these important cultural texts by the time that we were, when we were kids, basically. You know? Right, exactly, which gives them even more of an outsized standing in your mind compared to yeah. what was coming out at the time. 
you know. Yep. So your pick is my pick from the is 80s. with a nod. My mine's from the eighties with a nod to 1984, which is you know perhaps the expected choice. I picked 1986 because okay. it, to me the essence of a blockbuster is sequels and franchises, mm-hmm. and you had some pretty. Well, you had Poltergeist too, which. Um, <laughs> but so to me, this is the this is a quintessential blockbuster summer. Got kicked off May sixteenth with Top Gun, which is a to- Tony Scott, Tom Cruise quintessential eighties blockbuster movie, right? And that was also the summer we got Aliens, which is one of the best sequels. Karate Kid Part Two came out that summer, and then also even the sequels that are a little bit weird or didn't take off in the way that Aliens did are interesting. You know, I would rather have an interesting failure than a boring, bland success. Mm -hmm. And on that note, (laughs) the summer of 1986 brought us Under the Cherry Moon, Vamp, (laughs) Maximum Overdrive, a a lot of interesting stuff. Oh, and Howard the Duck also came out in the summer of 86. (laughs) Okay. But Uh, also The Fly. Yeah, The Fly, a remake, a good remake Mm -hmm. came out that summer. Also Mm -hmm. in that, in two kind of lower profile, but still sequels that I'm fond of, two horror sequels, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 and Friday the 13th Part 6. Both Uh. came out in the summer of 1986. And those are both fun, self-referential sequels that I think kind of speak to it. And yeah, so like on, in terms of the essence of the blockbuster I like it for that reason. Got it. Uh, it's certainly a great year, and I, and I agree that there's some really interesting stuff in there. Also, a Manhunter and Big Trouble in Little China, which don't really fit into the categories I laid out. <laughs> and uh, Transformers came the out movie. the same day as The Fly, right? Yes, they came out on the same day. What a day! What a day! Uh, Can you imagine? <laughs> Just yeah. stick around. Imagine for that me. double feature. Ah, oh, jealous! I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have to go with a year from the 80s as well. Okay. Um, even though there were some. 97 was the first year that I, I remember seeing almost everything in theaters. Mm-hmm. So that, that one will always have a place in my heart. I think ultimately there just aren't enough great movies from that summer. As, as much as I do like The Lost World and I do love Face Off, I think that 97 uh, is kind of a mixed bag ultimately, as, as most of the years from the 90s are. Uh, I want to cite a couple of them, just, just mention them because I think they're, they're worthy of mention. Oh. You you mentioned eighty four and that what that I think that is one one that gets cited a lot because yeah. there is you know I mean that was a kind of a huge year for a, a particular kind of blockbuster yeah it was just a summer that kicked off a lot of stuff that ended up having a lot of sequels for sure I mean, you have Ghostbusters that summer you have Gremlins mm-hmm. uh, the Karate Kid there was also uh, the second Indiana Jones movie was that summer the Temple of Doom you had a um, a John Hughes movie Sixteen Candles. A lot of good stuff. Purple Rain was that summer. Yeah. Yeah. 84 was a big one. I want to cite as well 88, which to me is really interesting because uh, that was a huge year for comedies. Mm-hmm. There was there was one, at least one big seminal action movie, which was Die Hard. But I think when you look at 88, the stuff that really sticks out is uh, is a lot of the, the studio comedies. You had mm-hmm. Who, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Coming to America, Bull Durham, Big, Tom Hanks, uh, A Fish Called Wanda. And Midnight Run all came out in the summer of '98 or yeah. uh, summer of '88. It's a big one. Yeah, it is a big one. Well, I'm just gonna inject here and say, since there was so much to choose from in '86, I left off two big ones, which is Labyrinth and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Both came out that summer. Yep, both both big movies, both seminal '80s movies for a, for a lot of people. Yeah, I think ultimately I have to go with '82. 82 is a good one, too. Yeah. So 82, you had The Road Warrior came out that year, Mm -hmm. that summer. Spielberg was still in play there because he had E.T., which obviously became the biggest hit of all time that summer. Poltergeist, which he may or may not have directed some of. We don't know, but (laughs) that came out that summer. The Possibly the best of the Star Trek movies, Star Trek II Wrath of Khan came out in the summer of 82. A Don Bluth animated film that I'm fond of, The Secret of Nim. Oh, that's a very scary one for, mm-hmm. for kids. Yep. It was the summer of Tron. It was the summer of Fast Times at Ridgemont High. A lot of game changers. For sure. And this, uh, if you want to talk about a single day, Manhunter and The Fly is pretty big. But is it as big as Blade Runner and The Thing both coming out <gasps> on the same day? On the same day. What a Wild. great afternoon that would be. Yeah. Neither hits, by the way. Yeah. Which is crazy to me now. <laughs> okay, so if you, Katie, if you had to choose your favorite summer blockbuster uh, of all time or maybe since Jaws, what would you pick? 
Mm, I I have to go with my heart and go with Jurassic Park. I really Mm -hmm. do. It's a good pick. And it was a huge, I mean, not only do I have a personal nostalgic attachment to it, it's a good movie, well-made movie. And also it was a huge game changer in terms of special effects. That's very true. Yep. And I I actually still think of it to to this day as sort of the the quintessential special effects movie, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, It's still the movie. When people talk about CGI, when people talk about special effects, I, I still think of Jurassic Park. And, you know, we were talking earlier about how glaringly obvious some of the CG from that era is. It's not in Jurassic Park. Definitely not. Which I will say also about my pick. Now, I mean, if I'm honest, I think that Jaws is probably the best summer blockbuster ever. Mm -hmm. I do think it's a masterpiece. I I think we could do a whole episode just talking about Jaws. Maybe we will. (laughs) Hey, July 4th. (laughs) There we go. Um, so I think that Jaws would be a, would be a great pick, but I think in terms of thinking about summer blockbusters and what what they mean and what they deliver, I think for me my pick would probably be Terminator Two. Yeah, that's a good movie too. Yeah, and and another one where the special effects have barely aged a day. Mm-hmm. And I think a big part of that is that Cameron, like Spielberg, understood at least at that time that CGI was one of many tools at his disposal. He didn't try to show us things that the technology could not handle. Mm -hmm. He basically used the CGI to augment practical effects. And I still think it looks great. And I still think of it as, for me, as kind of the summer movie that most captures what I want from a summer movie which is just this huge rush of emotions. It's, it's exciting, but also it, it, it has a certain gravity to it too. And it's, it's one of the few summer blockbusters I've ever seen that really feels like it delivers on the promise of uh, spectacle on the level that you want from these giant event movies. See, that's how I feel about Jurassic Park. You know, when they first yeah. get to the park and they come around the corner and they see the, uh, the brontosauruses and, you know, everybody feels like Laura Dern just jaw open sticking your head out of the top of the jeep like wow i never thought i'd see that (laughs) so i think we i also think that we can both probably agree that of the modern era of of like maybe the last 10 to 20 years Mm -hmm. that fury road is probably towards oh yeah fury road just bulldozes any any other uh big event film made in this this decade i would say yeah easily totally Well, on that note, that's all we've got for you today. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Film Club wherever you get your podcasts. And this week's episode of Film Club was hosted by me, Alex Dowd, and by Katie Reif. It was produced and edited by Carl Blumberg. Our sound mixer and finishing editor is Seth Hafer. And our motion graphics designer is Julie Mullins. There may be no summer movies this summer, but there will be plenty of episodes of Film Club. We'll be back next week with a new one. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.